Hello, I'm Greg with Primal Rights. One of the easiest ways to determine if someone doesn't know what they're talking about is if they express neck tension in thousandths of an inch. You probably have heard this before when someone expresses the neck tension that they have and they're trying to describe just how many thousandths smaller in diameter their neck is in comparison to their bullet diameter thereby giving you some indication of just what kind of seating force is there. And actually, that's not even true either. Folks, that is just how silly some of this stuff is. People are talking about these things with some level of certainty because they've heard someone else express it that way. And early in my career, that's exactly how I expressed it. You want to know why? Because I heard someone else talk about it in that way. And it wasn't until I got a much greater understanding of what's going on before I realized that the entire premise behind that discussion is flat wrong. Now that I've got everybody good and fired up, let me elaborate. The idea here is that bullet seating force and how much pressure it takes to get that bullet in there is going to have a determinate impact on what's going on downrange, and I mean that literally. Meaning if you've got more seating force on one bullet, and you've got less seating force in the next cartridge that you load, well, if those two differences are great enough, then you're gonna see a performance impact downrange. I would consider this part of this discussion to be common knowledge. However, trying to express tension in linear measurements is just completely and patently wrong. On this particular graph, there's a bunch of rounds that were loaded. The ones at the bottom of the graph down here, those were all cartridges that had been through my process, my recommended way of hand loading. So they've been fired and then I've put them through my entire process using all of the techniques that I recommend. And you can see that the seating force is very low and it's also very consistent amongst this batch of rounds. Next, here's a cartridge that is literally the exact same brass. You can see that it's way up here in seating force. It's so drastically away from the rest of these. These cartridges measured out exactly the same. There's no difference dimensionally. The exact same die was used, the exact same bushing, the exact same expander mandrel in the die. There was no dimensional change. You need to understand that the diameter interference between the interior neck diameter of your case and your bullet diameter does not equate to neck tension, seating force, or pulling force, meaning the release force, all things being equal. Granted, when we're firing these things in our rifle, the release force is determined upon the charge weight and the pressure curve, you know, the, the burn curve, the, the way that the propellant actually burns and creates the release of the bullet will vary from cartridge to cartridge and, and load to load. You can see how the diameter here really doesn't mean anything with the exception of establishing a known working parameter for your brass. So here's the terminology that you need to start using when describing bushing sizes and mandrel sizes and all of these various diameters. It is diameter interference. Now you can speak about this in many different ways in terms you can just call out the diameter of the ID of your neck, and you can do it that way. Um, you can speak about the diameter interference as it pertains to a relationship between the ID of your case and your bullet diameter, or you can speak about it in a relationship between your ID, your ID inner diameter of your neck, and the expander mandrel in your die. Now, well, why can't we talk about it with just the way that everybody's talking about it and say, well, it's X amount of thousands of... Well, the reason we can't do that is because different brass with different metallurgical properties will have different characteristics and how much grip it has on the bullet. And this is very easily demonstrated by the example that I shown in the graph earlier because those are exactly identical pieces of brass and the same thickness, the same exact die, the same diameters everywhere, despite that fact creating a gigantic disparity of bullet seating force. So the neck wall thickness of the brass is a variable as well. And that dictates that, you know, if you've got the same type of material and all things being equal, it is thicker rather than thinner, well then the force that it's going to be applying on whatever you squeeze in there is typically going to be greater. 
Now, brass being malleable, whether we anneal it or not is going to have a variance on this as well. And so the hardness or the nature of the material itself. You see how trying to talk about this with diameter being the only real variable that's discussed is just ignoring a whole bunch of other factors that are going to definitely have an impact on how these rounds shoot and most certainly where they shoot. So if it doesn't necessarily create a precision problem, it will most definitely create an accuracy problem. In this same conversation, it, it bears talking about another myth. People go and watch content from content creators or they read an article by somebody and they just arbitrarily decide that this stuff is true rather than go and shooting it for themselves. And so they're parroting everything that they saw before and then the next person comes and does the same thing and they go create content on it and further mislead everyone into thinking that that's the only way to accomplish this. So it has long been held that one thousandths or two thousandths of attention is the only way to get precision rifle rounds to shoot well. Folks, I'm here to tell you right now that it's one of the greatest myths that's ever been perpetuated in the discipline of precision rifle shooting. Now, I'll save you the suspense right now and clue you into the fact that literally every single group or shot fired in terms of accuracy on target or anything like that, if you've watched my channel and you've seen me demonstrate the capabilities of a centerfire rifle, you are witnessing roughly four plus thousandths of diameter interference. Yeah, four to five, sometimes even six thousandths of what people would say. When I'm setting up my short action customs dies to load this stuff, I am using a expander mandrel in every single one of my dies that is three thousandths under bullet diameter. That means if I'm shooting a seven millimeter, it's a 281 expander. Seven millimeter, 284, I'm running three thousandths under bullet diameter. I'm running three thousandths under bullet diameter in all of my calibers. Every cartridge from 20 caliber all the way to 30 caliber. I am running the same three thousandths under expander. I don't need a half thousandths more. I don't need a half thousandths less. I literally set them all. Whether I have neck turned, whether I have not neck turned, whether I'm annealing, not annealing, and everybody knows I'm annealing every firing, three thousandths under bullet diameter across the board, no changes, no variations in every cartridge, every wildcat, every standard spec cartridge, every brass manufacturer. Now I have further content that's gonna be coming out to demonstrate just how this doesn't matter and how you can set your and tune every other aspect of this around it. And it, what we're looking for here is consistent bullet release. So I'm changing either powder type, the amount of propellant that's being used, the bullet seating, right? How much jump or lack of, depending on. The bullet type, obviously I can just go to a different bullet that shoots better in the rifle. And then my primer seating depth. That's what I'm playing with when I'm tuning. I'm not touching. Not touching. Because all of that instruction that I was given by people that I thought that I could trust that they've done the work and they're not just parroting something that someone else told them to do was wrong. I didn't need to change my bushing diameter once I had set it. With an expander mandrel that's three thousandths under bullet diameter, I end up with a diameter interference fit of approximately four to five thousandths. It really depends on the thickness and the hardness and metallurgical makeup of my brass, just exactly what my diameter interference is on those projectiles. Bullet diameter from one manufacturer of the next can vary a good half thousand, sometimes more. That diameter interference is critical to my process because as I was previously instructed to run one or two thousandths of diameter interference, I quickly learned that if you do that, as a field shooter, you're gonna run into environmental conditions that are going to cause your ammunition to literally fall apart while you're en route to your hunting destination or while you're out on your hunt. The bullets themselves, the brass, if they're subject to a certain temperature or a certain temperature variation, right? Whereas they start out in one condition and go to a different condition in a short period of time, 
those rounds can literally just come undone by themselves. I mean, they'll literally change your bullet seating depth on a whim. This super light interference with the bullet is not a desirable thing if you really want consistent quarter MOA or better performance out of your guns. It's critical that I use an expander mandrel and critical that I use an expander mandrel that is set up correctly and done during my full length sizing up to make sure just the way the short action customs dies are set up and the Forster dies that I typically used before them with a high rise expander that ensures that when the neck is being expanded on the reverse stroke of the press that the cartridge case neck has not left the neck sizing portion of the die before that handoff goes to the expander. So that means that the expander is coming into the neck shoulder junction and starts opening the brass and pulling on it before the top of the neck has left the portion of the die that's squeezing it down. This is a critical handoff and a critical functionality of dies that most people do not fully appreciate. In terms of raw die design and what has allowed me to become the shooter that I am today, this is one of the very critical elements that allows me to have very consistent results and not have flyers that everyone else seems to be plagued with. Because I have such a heavy diameter interference between my expander and my brass and the bullet and my brass, I can move a bunch of material. Because I'm moving a bunch of material, a small variation in that material or the speed at which I'm operating these different devices will not have a large impact on the overall performance that I get when the bullet and the cases come together or when they are released. Whereas if I was moving a very small amount of material each time and there wasn't much interference, well then a very small variable can create a very large difference in performance. And that's the last thing that we want as precision rifle shooters. Folks, you need to be challenging things. You need to be thinking about things. You need to be willing to take chances in the setup of your equipment and do the testing to see if the results actually match up with what people think. And oftentimes you find that they do not. What has been considered a standard practice and what a bunch of people would tell you is the right way to do things in this discipline end up not being right. When you start looking at things from a fresh point of view and you start wanting more consistency, less chance for things to not go wrong, and you think about them logically, well, each operation that you're performing can be improved by some small degree or by some very large degree. The separation from people that actually know and the people that are just parroting something that they got told to do is gigantic. It is in sometimes an unbridgeable gulf between those two categories of people. So if there's anything that I can get you to do in this video is to think with your own mind. Don't just parrot what you see someone else doing. And the next time you see someone advocating for one thousandths of you can know explicitly that they have not thought about this correctly. They have not actually done the work. They have not pressured into it to acknowledge the other variables. And there's quite a number of other variables that dictate just how difficult or easy it is to seat a bullet. Now keep in mind here, I'm talking about field shooters, right? Talking about this, talking about that, and that. If you're going in the field with one thousandth of diameter interference on your hunting ammo, you got a real problem. Competition shooters, you guys can do whatever you want. Nobody cares whether you win or lose except you. Folks, it should not be super easy to move your bullets around in the case. It really should not. The variable of diameter interference is not tied to the other variables in this equation, such as your brass neck thickness, the metallurgical consistency of that brass, the hardness of it, which those two things can kind of go hand in hand. Then you've got the surface lubricity, the innate surface lubricity to think about. Obviously, if you had a super clean, brush cleaned brass interface on the, on the inside of your case neck, that is going to seat a bullet differently than if you had one that is well manicured through a tumbling, a tumbling in rice the way that I do or, or something of that effect. So, and, and there are other variables that are less easy to discuss and, and not easy to unpack in the time that I've got allotted for this video. But the point is, is that you cannot effectively tie diameter interference 
to bullet seating force. They are mutually exclusive and cannot be talked about together as if they both are going to be constant. I understand why this happens, folks. It's human nature to try to take a very complex set of variables and, and compress them down into something that's easy to discuss. As I've demonstrated here in the data from the AMP press graph, you cannot express bullet seating force in diameter interference numbers only. There's too many other things that are going on here that can affect the outcome. And so the neck tension argument is completely invalidated. There is no proper way to talk about neck tension in the way that it's being discussed by most creators right now. And even if we move past that and we could just establish that, okay, well, there's other variables that need to be talked about along with the neck tension variable, which I don't agree with that terminology at all. We still have people advocating for ultra light grip on that bullet, which is contrary to everything that I found in terms of keeping things consistent from one round to the next, from one session to the next. People's guns coming apart on them, meaning that the, the performance of their rifle changes on a whim from one session to the next, and they can't figure out why. Folks, this is, this is one of the number one variables that I have seen cause problems for people in their shooting. So folks, stop thinking that you know based on what someone told you. Instead, do the work. Do the work, and then you can know. If you're not doing the work, you can't know. Next week, I've got another video coming up that features the AMP press here and just how amazing the data you can pull off of this thing. The determinations that you can make about the quality of your operation or the, the quality of the processes that you're doing or the components that you're using. The AMP press is the cornerstone of being able to really know what's going on. It's taken the guesswork out of this bullet seating force thing. So if you don't have one of those presses, you really should get one and some quality inline dies. And by quality, I mean a custom Wilson style inline seater or the brand new, this is a prototype model here, but this is the short action custom infinity bullet seating die. I saw that they just had, uh, I think, a pre-order for those. Yeah. So the amp press and that cedar, that's some good stuff right there. With that, you can not guess at what someone's telling you. You can actually verify exactly what's going on. So the next time you hear someone talk about neck tension and they're expressing it in thousandths of an inch and not filling in any of the other parts of the equation, yeah, you can know that they probably don't know what they're talking about.